let's just uh, start with a few prayers in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, you told us that whenever two or more are gathered in your name, that you are present. And Susan and I are gathered in your name, and we'd like to acknowledge your presence, rejoice in your presence, and thank you for just the honor of bringing us together as sisters in Christ. Um, we'd like to pray for all of the moms that are trying to sign on. Um, I always appeal to Our Lady of Technological Services. <laughs> that <she> could, <laughs> That's a new title. <laughs> that she could in, uh, and I always like to invite our Blessed Mother to the meetings because I figure, you know, she can be anywhere she wants to. <laughs> so, That's right, she's a mom. She's a mom and she's supernatural. So uh, we turn to our Blessed Mother and uh, we would rejoice in your intercession. We ask for the Holy Spirit to use our hearts, our tongues, and our minds um, to serve the moms that are uh, joining us today. So we, and we pray. I was in adoration this morning and we pray that if there, any, if there is anyone in bondage um, and they're joining us today with any kind of form of hostility, that we may find a way to touch their hearts. Um, we also pray for um, any intruders that are, you know, hoping to sabotage our session today. Um, we just take all of that negative energy, we claim authority over it, and we send it to the foot of the cross. We pray to St. Michael, St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do that, O Prince of the Heavenly Host. By the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits. Prowl about the world, looking for the ruin of souls. Amen. And we turn to our Blessed Mother, praying a decade of the Rosary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. And maybe just three Hail Marys for um, the travesty in uh, uh, France today for those who died, those who are suffering. And um, yeah, just to pray for them, three Hail Marys. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. And uh, we just beg for the Holy Spirit to boing, anoint the moms that are forgetting to sign on. <laughs> oh, <dear>. Where are they? <laughs> so come, Holy Spirit, come. Um, and so we've got uh, two minutes before uh, we uh, broadcast. Um, are, are you familiar at all with uh, Moira Noonan and her yeah. work? Yes, I know Moira. Yes, I do. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, she uh, she spoke at two of our conferences because she was in Toronto. Oh, wow. Okay. This was years ago now, uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, so we were excited to have her. Um, I, I used to heavily be into yoga, and I I uh, like I always say that there were two parts of my life: one that was heavily involved into yoga, and then another part of my Catholic life. It didn't make any sense to me because there were so many things going wrong, right? And I kept on asking priests, you know, is it okay that I do yoga? And they're like, oh, sure, it's fine, it's fine, no problem, you know, it's just yeah. stretching. And so I kept on doing it, but something inside of me kept on saying, there's something just like off about this, but I couldn't find anyone Catholic to confirm that there was something wrong with me doing yoga and yoga made me feel so good, but I had all these uh, complications in my life. And uh, I guess I stumbled upon Moira's book, I think at, uh, at a conference at Franciscan University of Steubenville. And it was the first book that said, you know, that I stumbled across that said, you know, maybe you shouldn't. And so I was really struggling with quitting yoga because on the one hand, it made me feel so good, right? But then on the other hand, yeah. And so then I always say that the good Lord works in my life by asking me questions very often. And then the question I got asked was, well, could you see, you know, St. John Paul doing these poses? And I was like, no. And then, well, could you see Mother Teresa doing these poses? And it was like, no. And then he's like, well, aren't you trying to become a saint? And I'm like, yes. And so then if they're not, then why, you know, are you? And so I said, okay, I'll try going off of it for a year. And then I'll, you know, that I'll give you, Lord. And the results were miraculous and dramatic. And um, I swore off yoga. <laughs> it was like, okay, I got to work. Yeah, you know, and it was funny because you, you mentioned about bondage. And I thought, huh, you know, she knows what she's talking about here. Because that's, that's what happens with people in yoga. And they say, it's just exercise. But then it's like, well, why won't you give it up then? And why do you get so upset? When people mention something to you, that's already a sign that you're in bondage. Yeah. You're already in bondage to it. You don't even know it. Oh. Hang on. I better get my phone out of here. It's, you know, election time, so. Yeah, no, I, uh, it's exciting. And my cat's laying here on the floor. If you hear whining, that's them in the background. Okay, so <laughs> we're ready to go. <laughs> okay, so we're ready to go live. Um, one, two, three, broadcast. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, Dorothy Polarski, and I'd like to welcome you to Midday Moms every Tuesday, two o'clock. We're here reaching out to the mothers in our archdiocese and beyond. Yesterday was kind of cool. I heard from a mother's group leader in Ireland and she said, I really want, you know, to share Susan's talk. Are you gonna be able to help us? And I said, of course, I'm gonna be able to help you. So I do wanna welcome uh, Susan Brinkman. I can't tell you what an honor it is to have her here. If I uh, burst out into tears, you're going to know why. Uh, it's just such an honor. I've been reading her work for years. And uh, when she said yes, I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I was so excited. <laughs> so um, I, I'm just going to formally introduce Susan. Uh, before I start welcoming you, I know I'm changing things up because usually 
I welcome everybody first, but today, I don't know, the Holy Spirit's calling me to introduce Susan first. So uh, I like to listen to the Holy Spirit when he gives me clear instructions. So this is a uh, um, Susan Brinkman, and Susan is the an, an author and an award-winning journalist, and she is a member of the Third Order of, I always struggle with how to say that word. Discount. Discount. Discount <laughs> Carmelites. Yes. She serves as the Director of Communications and New Age Research for Women of Grace, and she's a frequent guest on EWTN's Women of Grace television show. She is the co-founder of the Catholic Life Institute, which is an educational apostolate devoted to teaching the authentic Catholic contemplative tradition. Susan formerly worked as a correspondent for the Catholic Standard and Times, the newspaper for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. For the past 10 years, she has been the lead researcher for Women of Grace's New Age Q&A blog, which is the largest blog of its kind in the world. The Library of Information now exceeds 1,200 entries on everything from acupuncture, angels to Wicca and yoga. She has also authored 11 books, including, including the Learn to Discern Compendium, Is It Christian or New Age, which has an imprimatur from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Liguri Publications published the story of her conversion entitled, We Need to Talk, God Speaks to a Modern Girl. Along with Jonette Benkovich, she co-authored the Young Women of Grace Study Program, which teaches girls 13 plus about what it means to be authentically feminine. Her latest publication is The Catholic Guide to Mindfulness, published by Avila Institute, which has an impromptuor from the Diocese of Birmingham. The Catholic Life Institute Press has published four of her books, Pray Like a Catholic, Live Like a Catholic, Mindful Like a Catholic, and Live the Little Way, all which have impromptuors from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Her National Journalism Awards include the Bernadine O'Connor Award for Pro-Life Journalism, the Eileen Egan Journalism Award from Catholic Relief Services, and numerous awards from the Catholic Press Association and the Philadelphia Press Association. So I'd like you all at home to give Susan a big warm welcome. Uh, we are so excited and so honored to have her here. Uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you for your yes. Thank you for joining us. I know that you're extremely busy and you've got a lot on your plate and it's election time and you said yes. So thank you so very, very much. I wanted to take a few minutes to welcome all of you that are signing on. Uh, Patricia, one of our mother's group leaders at St. Anne's in Brampton, welcome. Vesna, welcome. Joan Beggs, all the way from Staten Island, New York, welcome. It's great to be here. It's great to, great to have you here. Claude, um, thank you for joining us from St. David's Parish in Maple. Um, Catherine Serzani, hello, hello. Liz Garcia from, <laughs> I've known Liz since grade, since kindergarten. <laughs> That's a long oh, time. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, Adriana from St. Catherine of Siena. Um, please, uh, you know, say hello to us. Tell us how many kids you have. Tell us what questions you might have. Uh, we love hearing from you. I do want to tell those of you who are here. Oh, Nicola from Ireland. Yay! <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Um, so why are we here? That's always like the big question. Well, we are here because of COVID, to be quite straightforward with you. Um, you know, uh, we work in partnership with the Archdiocese of Toronto in helping moms start mothers groups. And we have started about 40 mothers groups in our archdiocese. And usually those mothers groups meet face to face and they're parish based. Um, but we 
couldn't, we can't meet face to face in parishes. And so as the founder of catholicmomsgroup.com, I was so inspired by Cardinal Collins, who every single day from the first day of the breakout of COVID and the church is closing, closing every single day, he was on, you know, TV celebrating mass. And I love going to daily mass. And I thought, well, if the leader of archdiocese is reaching out every single day, I have a duty as the founder of Catholic Moms Group to reach out. And I'm like, I can't do it every day. I'm not quite as holy as he is, but I would like to reach out to all the moms in our archdiocese to let you know that we love you, that we care for you, we are here for you. And COVID is not gonna stop us from ministering to the moms in our archdiocese. So um, just a few little things about our ministry. I'm gonna share with you, I'm excited to share with you. Um, okay, so our ministry is, is catholicmomsgroup.com. We are on a mission to revive the vocation of motherhood, and we do so primarily by helping parishes start mothers groups. It drove me absolutely nuts when I saw so many Catholic parishes ordering Protestant materials, and I'm kind of like, Protestant materials for a Catholic mother's group? Are you crazy? <laughs> um, you know, we want to become icons of our Blessed Mother. And how can you justify using a Protestant mother's group starter kit? It drove me nuts as a young mom. And uh, anyway, so in partnership with the Archdiocese of Toronto, we've been able to create a mother's group starter kit for Catholic mother's groups. Um, you know, women always said to me, why don't you do anything for women? You only ever do things for moms. And I'm like, okay, we'll have an annual conference. <laughs> and so that conference is Dynamic Women of Faith Conference, and we cater to the women in our archdiocese. Um, last year, we had to pivot into a virtual conference. We had Kimberly Hahn and Colleen uh, Campbell. There's a third name, I always forget her name. <laughs> but uh, Anyway, so we're on a mission to revive the vocation of motherhood. We have helped over 40 parishes start Catholic mothers groups. Um, some of them are moms and tots. Some of them are more like an oasis just for moms. And uh, we now are serving parishes outside of the Archdiocese of Toronto. So we're really, really excited and pumped about that. And um, Midday Moms basically is a response to COVID. So we've been hosting, um, many of our mothers group leaders are still hosting their one-on-one um, -on -one meetings, but they're doing it on Zoom and it's a smaller format. And so if you want uh, to attend a meeting with five or six or seven moms on Zoom, um, we've got many mothers groups, you know, St. Benedict's does that, St. Leo's does that, St. Francis de Sales does that. So we are here for you. We've created all sorts of materials. We've got a publication, How to Start a Mothers Group. We've got 52 studies for those mothers groups. I could go on and on about our ministry because I love it so much, but I won't do that. That's not what we're here for. We host an annual Catholic Mothers Summit. Um, you know, last year we had Sister Barige McKenna. No, no, that was the year before at our summit. So uh, anyway, we're here for you. We love you. And uh, we want you to know that you have a special mission as a mom. And sometimes as mothers, you know, sometimes as mothers, we make mistakes. <laughs> And I made a big mistake by getting involved. Uh, this was before I was married. Uh, I was heavily involved into uh, yoga and it ended up causing me a lot of problems. And I started to read, 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 read. Anyway, I'm not gonna share my story right now. That's not what we're here for. We're here to hear from Susan Brinkman. And before Susan starts her reflection, again, a big warm welcome to 
Jane, a big warm welcome to June, a big warm welcome. Andrea Schreiber has a beautiful mother's ministry in the Waterloo region. Um, Kiera, welcome. She attended our How to Start a Mother's Group workshop, and I'm really hoping, Kiera, that you're going to start a mom's group. Anyway, so welcome to all of you, and welcome, uh, Susan. So, Susan, I've talked too much. I always say I should come with a stop <laughs> button. <laughs> uh, Susan, can you, can you tell us? us a little bit about yourself and you can you tell us a little bit how you got involved in um, just the whole new educating people in the new age area i'd love to hear a little bit more about you and how you got involved in the area well that's my my naughty girl story that's what i call it <laughs> my naughty girl story <laughs> which i was stupid enough to publish um, but uh, that's that's the book that you mentioned we need to talk god speak to a modern girl and i really did think i was a know-it-all but I, myself, and it's full disclosure now to everybody here, I'm not here as Miss Holier than thou to talk about this subject. I dabbled in a lot of this stuff during my 15 years away from the church. Um, so I'm not here today as Miss Know-it-all. <laughs> I'm here as Miss Learn the Hard Way. <laughs> That's about the way it was for me. I got very involved in all this stuff. I just thought I knew better. The church was just a a bunch of patriarchs and pointed hats that didn't know anything about women and you know keep your rosaries off my ovaries i was one of these type you know and um the lord kind of brought me to my knees during some uh, some bad time in my life i was going through some uh my husband left and i just had all kinds of things when i lost my job and but i had one thing that that really motivated me and really held me together and that was my great great love of writing and I truly believed, even though I was away from the church, I truly believed that my writing was a gift from God. I never let go of that. I just always felt connected to him through that writing. And it was through really a miracle that he worked in my life that had to do with my writing that got me back to the church and got me back to him. So, and I was dabbling around, as I said, in all these things. And I say, well, Lord has a real sense of humor. <laughs> all of a sudden, you get to me, you know, oh, I, I knew all about this stuff, right, Lord? Yeah, no, you didn't, Sue. <laughs> now I'm going to teach you what you are involved in. So, yeah. Um, and now I've been doing this for well over 10 years. Well, actually, 10 years just with John Ed. Um, and I started it back in 03 when the Vatican published the document, Jesus Christ, the Bearer of the Water of Life. And I was working for the Catholic Standard and Times at that time. And, and uh, my editor said to me, Sue, I want you to report on this. You know, report on this. And I started reading this. And I couldn't believe the stuff I was reading. I thought, I know what about this stuff. Reiki, yoga, psychics. I know all about this stuff. You know, I had no idea it was what it says in that document. I had no idea about it. The new age to me was just something harmless. I had no idea about all the philosophy behind it, the ideology, none of that stuff. I didn't know any of it. So that's how I got started. So I guess it's been since 03. So I've almost been in this now researching this. Um, I did a little bit of investigative reporting. So I kind of bring that to my work. Mm -hmm. I kind of look for facts and I lay out the facts. And then, uh, you know, I let people, I'll let the chips fall where they may. A lot of people don't like me for that. But <laughs> I just give them the facts, you know, I'm just telling you the facts. I think you and I should shake hands because I got a lot of relatives that don't like me too, you know, like I'm the crazy yeah. extreme one. Um, so, you know, tell us a little bit about yoga. People say, well, it's, you know, I'm just stretching. It's a healthy exercise. Oh, yeah. There's two oh, types yeah, yeah. of yoga. There's the chanting yoga and there's the harmless yoga. Tell us a little bit about uh, yoga. That's a new one. Uh, well, you know, the, the, the <laughs> six little words, but I'm just doing the exercises. That is the mainstay of the multi-billion dollar yoga market. At least that's what it is in America. I'm sure it is that way in Canada as well. Um, but, you know, just like the catchy, you know, most catchy marketing phrases, um, it leaves a lot unsaid. And I think probably the most damning piece of evidence weighing against yoga, at least in my book, um, and against the idea that it could be just exercise is found in the fact that yoga is a Hindu spiritual practice and it was never meant to be an exercise program. We tried to make it into that. So Father Mitch Packwell, he states in his book, Catholics in the New Age, he says Hindus did not devise these exercises, which are known as asanas uh, in, in yoga lingo, for athletic limbering or muscle building. All were meant 
to lead the practitioner to enlightenment and, and an awareness of his or her inner divinity. So that led me to the question being the reporter. Okay, so if you could just do the exercises. How could you just do the exercises if the exercises aren't just exercises? Ah. Yeah, what's, there's, a, there's a disconnect there. Something's not right with this. Um, and really, they are integrally associated, when you study even deeper into this, with the worship of Hindu gods. And this comes right from the Hindus now. BKS Iyengar, who is the author of, of uh, Light on Yoga, which is really the Bible of the yoga industry, um, he says they are also called, these positions and the poses, are also called after gods of the Hindu pantheon. And some recall the avatars or incarnation of divine power. So for instance, the sun salutation, that one, that's usually, you do that at the beginning of every class. Um, that is paying homage to Sariah, the Hindu sun deity. And the cobra pose worships the kundalini snake that is supposedly awakened in the chakras. And the fish asana worships the Hindu deity Vishnu. So it goes on and on and on. The warrior worships Lord Virabhadra and then the downward dog actually reenacts the Hindu worship of the dog that happens for five days each November. They worship the dog and they decorate them and they 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 look beautiful. They love dogs. I do too, but you know, <laughs> I don't worship them. I do not worship them. You know, and the corpse asana, which is really kind of creepy, but it represents the death or extinction of the person when yogic unification with the Hindu deity Brahmin wipes out your existence and your identity that's that's what that's what enlightenment is it's actually the end of you your existence as a person so when i read about all this stuff and i thought to myself and i thought it was just a stretch <laughs> Jeez, you know that's one heck of a stretch you know <laughs> so anyway the spiritual nature of yoga really is is very evident in classes even though people think it's innocent such as that namaste bow which actually means i bow to the god within you and they're not talking to the presence of god within you they're talking to brahman the, the Om chant that's used in many classes, that's the sound that Brahman makes in every creative act. This is their belief now, the Hindu beliefs. That's the sound that Brahman makes in each creative act and, and that we contain, they believe we contain this original sound in our memory. And when we repeat that sound, it invites Brahman and all the Hindu gods to enter into us and speed up our process of enlightenment. So that's what that Om chant really means. Wow, I didn't. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, and it, there's a lot more than that. I mean, I know we only have a limited time, so, but many people, though, they, they'll say, but, but Sue, I'm not worshiping other gods when I go there. That's not what I'm doing. That is not my intention. Now, and if, if it was your intention, of course, that would be a violation against the first commandment. And while intentionality is indeed necessary for something to be a sin, there are other ways that you can sin through the practice of yoga. And one of the number one is, is read Romans 14. It tells us, do not be a stumbling block to your brother, even if you disagree with their position. So as long as a fellow Christian is troubled by what you're doing, you continue to do it anyway. St. Paul tells us your, your conduct is no longer in accord with love. This is what's called scandal. You're creating scandal. No, it's a serious sin. It's a serious sin, and and scripture is full of examples of that teaching. Um, now, let me ahead. ask you a, another question. Something I've like, you know, sometimes some of my mother's group leaders will, you know, ask me, you know, Dorothy, can we do this or can we do that? And I, I you know, a little while ago, I had a request by one of our mother's group leaders. Well, Dorothy, there's like a Catholic version of yoga, and I want to introduce it at our parish and my, you know, my priest is okay with it. And I'm like, no, like as long as I am the founder, I don't know the founder of what, <laughs> but so long as I'm in charge, there are, there's no form of Christian yoga, Catholic yoga, nothing, nothing, nothing that could potentially lead moms to yoga in our network. Um, you know, and I said, I would have to take this Catholic Christian yoga to, you know, Susan and talk to her about it. And right now I don't have time to do that. I'm, you know, busy launching this ministry. I'm not going to let, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do this. And I know it caused a little bit of division. Now she, she listened to me, thank goodness. And, and, um, 
but, but what are your thoughts on, you know, the Catholic version of we're praying the rosary while we're doing this? Okay, there now there is, Dorothy, there are, there is one program in particular called Soul Corps. Okay. Um, and I'll put that up in a chat box for you. Um, and I, think, I think maybe that's what she was even suggesting. Yeah. I can't Soul remember. Corps is not yoga. Okay. That's not yoga. I know those women. I've been in touch with them and checked out their whole, uh, their whole program and that sort of thing and that is not yoga okay at all it's not even associated with yoga even though some of the things that they're doing look like yoga okay you understand that the body can only move a certain number of ways and not every posture that looks like a downward dog is necessarily a downward dog i mean that's all that's actually an isometric stretch for the calves that particular okay. position i used to be a fitness instructor so i mean a lot of this stuff that they're saying is a yoga pose really isn't a yoga pose Okay. Um, but now Christian yoga is a different thing. That's whole, all completely different from, from something like soul core. Okay. Um, Christian yoga uh, is where they're doing actual yoga asanas and those same poses, um, but they're trying to Christianize them and, and make them into prayer. So in my book, that makes Christian yoga even worse than yoga being practiced just for exercise, because now you are doing this yoga for a religious or a spiritual me, uh, reason. And what does the Lord teach us about that in Deuteronomy 12, 31? What does he say to us? He says, do not worship me the way the pagans do. Okay. He doesn't want you to Christianize yoga. He doesn't want that. No, That's so what you want. Someone here has mentioned uh, a Stephen Ben Car B A N C A R Z. Are you familiar with him at all? No. Mm -mm. Yeah. Maybe if I saw his name. Okay. Well, uh, you know, we do want to. We're here to extend a warning to every single mom that, you know, before you participate in any kind of yoga, whether it's Christian, non Christian, like please check, um, you know, uh, Susan's library, because some of this stuff can get you into very, very, very serious trouble. It, you know, it got me into serious trouble. Yes, yes, and, it can. And, and I don't want to, you know, you know, get into that now, because that's not why we're here. Um, I'm hoping that someone here, um, you know, kind of renounces the practice of yoga today and says, okay, I'm out of this, um, because it can cause a tremendous amount of damage. Now, um, Susan, how about Reiki? Because that was, you know, something else that I went to a Reiki practitioner. I had no oh, yeah. idea that, <laughs> you know. I Reiki was sad, but before we get into Reiki, I just one other thing I really feel we have to add about the yoga. Um, and this is where we get the most of the mail at Women of Grace. This is how they're being damaged by yoga. Mm -hmm. um, when you are in a yoga class, you might be in there without any intention at all of worshiping those Hindu gods. But if the guy next to you is worshiping those gods, we know from the fathers of our church, Tertullian and um, St. Justin Martyr, um, even though pagan gods we know aren't real, demons hide behind them. So if that guy next to you is calling on the sun god and demon decides to answer him and you're not in a state of grace, you're open game. You can actually be oppressed and attacked by Satan just by being in that room. Bishop Edward Slatterly, he warned people, this was back in 2014, and it was along the same lines as this. He warned people, don't attend these black masses that they were, they were going to go out of curiosity at the Oklahoma City Civic Center. Mm -hmm. And people were just saying, oh, I'm just going to go just to watch, just to watch. He said, no, just being there puts you in grave danger of infection from the spirits that are being called down during that ritual. And in fact, he said, depending on your state of grace, you could risk outright possession. This is where people are having problems. They're going to these classes and all of a sudden things are starting to fall apart for them. You know, things are going wrong. They can't focus. They have insomnia. There's fighting in their family. All of a sudden, everything's breaking. Um, <laughs> all kinds of problems are happening to them. And we pinpoint it right away um, 
from the yoga. Are you in a yoga class? Get out of it. Get out of it right now. Go to confession. Renounce being in there and don't go back there again. And, and go, you know to, what? go to confession. Stopped. Yes, go to confession. Stopped. And it, it, it's shocking too because, you know, there was a time where I probably spent too much time on certain, you know, Catholic Facebook groups. And if you want to cause division in a Facebook group, you know, bring up yoga or bring up Harry Potter. Like that's a different, you know, <laughs> yoga <different>. wars. Yeah, <laughs> and it, like just people get so ag women get so aggressive defending, you know, yoga. And um, as you mentioned to me when we were speaking a little bit earlier, that that aggression is often a sign of possession, right? And not possession, and, bond bondage or bondage. Sorry. Bondage. Yeah, that's a sign of bondage. Right, right there is a sign of bondage. I mean, if you don't get that upset over sit-ups, why are you getting that upset over yoga? I mean, something's going on there that's not present in a sit-up class. <laughs> if, yeah. if all of a sudden you can't give it up. Um, now, of course, a lot of people could be pride. They just don't, don't want to think that, which would have been the case, was my case. I didn't want to say, don't tell me I'm, I'm doing anything like that. That's ridiculous, no. It's pride that stands in their way. They don't. They don't want to give into that. But but generally speaking, priests and and other people who work in deliverance will tell you that's their first clue, is that when you suggest it, they get all mad, and and it's and it's an inappropriate anger. Yeah, um, and, and, and they'll say things like, "This is why I quit the church because of people like you." And they start with the personal attacks and stuff like that. You know, right away, you need to start praying for that person. The person's in bondage, and they have no clue that they are. Yeah, and there's, there's something very, very powerful that uh, Paola Marshall here in the comments has mentioned. She said that I did mention uh, yoga to a priest and uh, he said it's not a sin and there was no need to confess it. And that, that's the other thing that moms need to be aware of is that many priests themselves, they have no idea, they haven't that's been right. educated in the you know the, the negative spiritual consequences of uh, of yoga and that's right that's right they don't know and 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 in fact it's not even just yoga dorothy it's it's the occult in general and i know it sounds like well how could they not learn about the occult but they don't they truly do not uh know about it. They're, they're not really taught that much about it you need to go to a priest who is adept in that area and understands that but if you go to confession and, and a priest says to you, don't worry about the yoga, it, there's nothing wrong with it. Just say to him, um, okay, thank you, Father, but I would just feel better if I confessed it to the Lord and received absolution for that. And there's no priest that's going to tell you I'm not going to give you absolution. So just yeah. go ahead and do it anyway. I mean, I've heard priests of priests who tell people Ouija boards are okay. Oh, you, yeah. know, you can go to a medium to, to contact your, your deceased Uncle Joe. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, and it's not... And it's not, I'm not knocking priests now. Um, I, I'm just saying that a lot of them aren't aware of a lot of this stuff. In fact, I just wrote a book called Fight Like a Catholic, and I, I put it up. It's at the very top of the, of the chat box. Um, and it, it just got an, an, an imprimatur on it um, from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And a, a priest friend of mine read the book and said, Sue, I had a couple that had something wrong with them. And he said, whatever rejects you have, give me all of them. And he gave them to all his seminarian and priest friends because they don't know this stuff. And it's basic stuff about Satan, who yeah. he is. It, it is. And I, I, I want to just to confirm that because, uh, again, you know, there was a time in my life where there was like this, the Catholic side. But at the same time, I was, you know, going to yoga. I was getting a Reiki treatment because I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. But I began to wonder and I had this hunch. And I asked one priest, I asked another priest, and another priest, and they all said it was okay, it's okay. We know you, Dorothy, and it's okay. But I couldn't understand all these problems and very serious problems I was having in this other aspect in my life. And so finally, I went to a conference at the Franciscan University of Steubenville, and I, 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 I stumbled upon you know, this book, Ransomed from Darkness, by Moira Noonan. And for those of you that have attended the Dynamic Women of Faith conference, uh, Moira has spoken twice at that conference. And it was this, you know, simple book that finally confirmed for me that, well, maybe there is something wrong. And I decided to take a year off from yoga. I said, okay, Lord, you know, I'm not willing to give it up forever, but I'll give it up for a year. And I did take it to confession. 
Um, and my life changed dramatically for the better, like dramatically. There were dramatic changes, and I'm not here to tell you my story, but I am tell you, I, I am here to tell you that yoga, based on my experience, can cause a lot of problems. And I'm, I'm really grateful that uh, Susan is here. Um, are there any other books that you would recommend specifically uh, about, you know, the danger? I know you mentioned a book by Father Rich Pava, Mitch Pava? Father Mitch Pava of EWTN. It's called Catholics in the New Age. Let me just type that in there. Okay. Um, that's a very good one. Um, I just updated the compendium. This is the Learn to Discern compendium. Uh, is it Christian or New Age? And that is the entire chapter, about 30 pages in there on yoga. Now, and, now and mothers, like, you know, because I get emails all the time, and I get mothers all the time sort of saying to me, well, Dorothy, you know, they're, they're, they're sharing yoga in my child's Catholic school, and they don't think there's anything wrong with it. So what can a Catholic mother do in those kind of situations where she's being told by, you know, the school administration that there's nothing wrong with it and her children are falling into the practices without her permission? I just actually did a blog on that last week because we get so many questions like that. It's yoga and mindfulness. Mindfulness has really begun to creep into schools at least here in the States. And, yeah, um, it is. It's, it's at, at our last meetup last week, um, there's a, a woman that was going to join us today that has had a dramatic conversion. She used to be a yoga practitioner, um, and she stopped everything uh, because of your work. And I was going to introduce you to her today. Um, it, a, lot of, a lot of conversions. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll get that blog post uh, from you and I can forward it on because I, I um, there's so much to talk about. Oh my gosh. I know, I know there is. I, this is a huge, <laughs> huge subject. I do, I do weekend long conferences on this and it goes, they go on and on and on and it could continue. Um, but yeah, no, I will be happy to, um, to give you that information. Um, what, First of all, when it comes to mindfulness, attorneys are already going after, at least in the United States, they're going after these schools because of the, uh, it's a violation of the Establishment Clause, it's a violation of the, uh, uh, church and state, because mindfulness, no matter how, how much they claim that they secularized it, it's impossible to secularize it, just like it's impossible to secularize yoga. You can't really do that. Um, and these attorneys, the American Center for Law and Justice, um, have been issuing letters uh, warning schools that have come up with these programs, you know, calm up and, and you know, mindful classroom and mindful, uh, mindful students and stuff like that. Um, and warning them that if you, you've got to drop that program or you're liable to be sued uh, for the establishment clause and you will lose because of the basis in Buddhism. And many, many schools have done it. Um, so they have been very effective. That's the American Center for Law and Justice. And you can go on their website and you'll find it on there. Um, and it, really, they responded to thousands of parents writing to them saying, hey, why are they bringing this stuff into my kid's school? Exactly. And, you know, mindfulness has very little solid science behind it. Most of the stuff you read in the newspaper is all hype. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it really doesn't have that much uh, behind it, and even less for children. And you think, why are you allowing your child's mind to be played around with like that and to be teaching the child, blank your mind. Just sit there and blank all thoughts out of your mind, whether they're good or bad thoughts. No, we don't teach our children that. When they're having a bad thought, we teach them to confront that and confess that. Bad thoughts can lead to bad actions. You don't teach a child that. You see how this can, you can go down a real, real uh, bad path. And as far as yoga is concerned, I just had a, a letter from a father. This was two weeks ago now. This is all providential. Um, and he said that he, his son came home and said, my coach is now going to have yoga in PE. And I don't know, should, should we do this? Should I do it, dad? And he said, no. And he explained to the, his son why he shouldn't do it. So his son went to school and told the teacher, I can't take this class. The teacher said, I don't understand. Why not? And he said, well, and he explained some things to him. Well, the teacher called the father mm -hmm. and the father explained to him what was wrong with yoga. And the coach said, I'm sorry, but I've never heard of this stuff before. I'm so, I'm so grateful to you that you educated me about this. And 
they're now having second thoughts about having this yogi in the class. He doesn't want to do it now. So a lot no, of times it, it would be, because they're not educated. I don't know if whether um, Women of Grace has this resource and if they don't, maybe, maybe you could create it, but it would be really good to have a, a short condensed booklet, you know, like because a school principal isn't going to read a book, you know, a right. priest might not read a book, but if you had a booklet specifically for priests and school principals, you know, I'd be the first one to buy 500 of them, right? Mm -hmm. Because very often what happens is, okay, you know, I have a very dear relative, a cousin that is heavily into yoga. And when I renounced it, she renounced me. And I can't explain it because I'm not as well read. I'm not as smart. I'm, I just know based on my experience, like I would love to have you and my cousin in the same room, but there's no way she'd show up on a thing like this. But if I had like a little booklet I could give her um, that linked her to other things, that would be a really powerful tool. And I promise I'd be your first customer. I'd buy 500 of those booklets and I'd send to, 10 to each of our mother's groups. Because very often moms don't have, they, they just don't know how to talk about it in a credible way. And we get reduced as being, you know, devotional, non-thinking, uneducated, over-the-top Catholics. Right, right. They think we're just being over-emotional and, and hysterical. And hysterical. Um, I, I have something. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can uh, put up my blog. I might be able to just give you the link to it. Okay. Um, yeah, here it is. There's the blog. Um, I do have a brochure on yoga. Okay. And that is for free. You can download it. I, I would send you, um, I would go ahead and send you the. Yeah. If you could email it to me, because yeah. sometimes I lose the chat and I, you know, I only have so much technological experience and then I can't find, you know, so if you could email it to me, I'll have it. Um, I'm just so excited to have you here. Oh my gosh. This is so, it's just so wonderful to have like the armed forces that know, you know, uh, on our, uh, uh, on our, on our, on our mother's group here at our, at our kitchen table. This is so cool. Um, now, Reiki, Reiki is huge. And um, a lot of women are involved in Reiki because they want to be healed. Do, do you have any, just give us. Yeah, Reiki does not heal anything. Reiki is an alternative healing method that's based on a pantheistic belief in the universal life force energy that permeates the universe. Um, there is no such thing as that life force energy. Okay. Uh, it's key, key, prana, vital force. That's the key in Reiki. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we know there is veritable energy, which is the stuff that, you know, mechanical vibrations such as sound, there's electromagnetic forces, there's monochromatic radiation. We know all that stuff. That's what we use for CAT scans, for MRIs and that. That's called veritable energy. What they're talking about here with Reiki, therapeutic touch, and so many others, there's hundreds of other new age, alternative healing methods based on this universal life force energy that's known as putative energy um, and that's what they're talking about there that energy has never been substantiated by science it does not exist and that's why there's never been any test to prove that reiki or therapeutic touch does anything because it's based on a premise that's just thin air mm -hmm. okay but what practitioners are doing this here's where reiki gets dangerous practitioners believe that they can channel this energy into into other people in order to enhance their life force. And they serve as a kind of channel. And, and you always know that Reiki is being performed on a person or on yourself is because the hands are hovering above the body. They don't actually touch you. And they'll hover there for several minutes. And supposedly that's allowing the patient to draw in whatever energy is needed from the universe. And where is this energy coming from? Well, it's coming from something known as the Reiki source. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's always unnamed. Mm -hmm. This is now according to the Reiki training manual. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in order to be able to practice this, a person has to be attuned to become a Reiki master. Mm -hmm. And that attunement is a, is a sacred spiritual initiation. And what it intends to do is connect you with higher levels of consciousness and this Reiki source. Mm -hmm. And that process is attended by Reiki guides and other spiritual beings who help to implement that process. And you go through three levels 
of, of this attunement until you reach the third level and you become a master uh, of it. Now, aside from these grave spiritual dangers, I mean, right then and there, you know, you don't have anything to do with that. Um, you have to stay away from this because people will try to tell you, oh, the Reiki source is the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. And that's why we're, we're laying our hands. You know, Jesus used Reiki to heal. <laughs> that's, I've heard that. I, I've heard that person. No, that, and they're serious <laughs> about that. They really mean it. And I think, wait a minute, where is that in the Bible? Where did you get that from? Um, it, what's, that's what's called cherry pick in scripture. <laughs> they kind of make it up. You know, in the typical council document that I mentioned earlier, Jesus Christ, the bearer of the word of life, it explains it this way. The new age God is an impersonal energy. God in this sense is the life force or soul of the world. This is very different from the Christian understanding of God as the maker of heaven and earth and the source of all personal life. God is in himself personal, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, when he appeared to Moses over the burning bush and Moses said, well, who should I tell the people you are? What did he say? He said, I am who am. He didn't say I am what is. Mm -hmm. I am who am. He identified himself as a person. He is not a life force energy. Mm -hmm. So it's very dangerous to be involved in Reiki. Reiki has been condemned by the USCCB. That's the uh, US Conference of Catholic Bishops. Um, it does nothing for your, your, your health at all. There's no proof to it. Um, it says in their, their document, to use Reiki, one would have to accept at least in an implicit way central elements of the worldview that undergirds Reiki theory elements that belong neither to Christian faith nor to natural science. So if you are having a Reiki treatment done to you um, and believe that it has worked, um, that is just, um, it's not real. It's not a real healing. Um, you do put yourself in, in some danger because uh, like I said, the Reiki source is not named. It could be anything mm -hmm. that, that they're connecting with out there, that they're driving the energy into you. Mm -hmm. um, you need to clean up after you had a Reiki. Yeah. And so, so I have a comment here from uh, Judith. She says, please encourage the ladies that have dabbled in any of these things that they are not lost forever, um, that God can oh, use anything not. for his purposes. And so if any of you have dabbled in Reiki, in Reiki, in horoscope, in astrology, in yoga, um, you know, it's good that you're here because it, it, it means that you're open and it means that you can help educate the moms. Like I always say that women, you know, moms love to talk. Well, why don't we use the, our love of talking for good? So, you know, when you get off our session today, you could phone five moms and you, you can say, hey, did you know that, you know, to five of your friends and get the word out. Um, yeah. Get it to confession because, you know, I had a lot of problems that got solved when I, you know, renounced these practices and went for a general confession and just confessed everything. And a lot of these things I had no idea were even, you know, a sins. And again, I'm not here to tell you my story. I'm here to uh, just share a little bit. Um, can we just switch the topic for a few minutes to astrology? Like, you know, so many of us check, or, you know, I used to always like, what's your sign, Dorothy? And then check the sign. Um, and Oh, this one, this one. Oh, I, I had hoped you wouldn't ask me about astrology because this is the one that really embarrasses me because I was so into astrology, Dorothy. Really? I, was, I was into natal charts and I went to a psychic that was also an astrologer and all that kind of stuff. And I was so into it. And then when I learned what astrology really is, I just was like, how could I have been that stupid? But I, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I mean, horoscopes, right, they're founded in astrology, which is not astronomy. That's okay. the number one thing. I had those two mixed up. Okay. Astrology is a Babylonian occult practice. Astronomy is a science. So that right off the bat is, is where you go. Wait, say that again. Say that again. Astrology. Astronomy is a science. Right. Astronomy is astrology, a science. Yes. Astrology is not a science. Astrology is a Babylonian occult art. A Babylonian. Two completely uh, different things. But I had never heard that it was a Babylonian occult. 
art? Absolutely. That's where it came from. That's, I, mean, I don't want to get into the whole Lucha because we don't have time, but that's where it all came from. Um, and, you know, astrologers believe that the location of the planets in relation to the constellations of Zodiac, yes, they have an influence on you, you know, from, especially from your birth date. And they believe that they can predict things from that. Well, here's the truth about it. Once again, back to Father Mitch, who was another one who dabbled in this stuff. <laughs> and he says, when they first came up with astrology, there were only five planets. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Well, what happened when they discovered the other planets? Well, as Father Paco says, nothing. They didn't change anything. What that does is allow individual astrologers to make up their own influences for those additional planets. So they're making most of this stuff up, but it gets worse. It gets worse. He explains that the actual zodiac is an imaginary circle around the ecliptic of the Earth's annual trip around the sun. And I'm not going to give you a test on that. Mm -hmm. Just this, but astrologers separated that into 12 sections of 30 degrees each. But astronomers, the scientists there say, no, that's wrong. They're not 30 degrees each. They, there's those degrees range anywhere from 7 to 37.5. And what this all amounts to is that everyone needs to change their astrological sign. Whatever, they, whatever date the newspaper gives you for your sign, you need to move it back one whole sign because that in fact is your real sign according to science <laughs> oh so anyway in other words i'm not a leo i'm a cancer oh no <laughs> i'm a cancer so now listen to this it it's a total waste of time trust me a scientific study was done on this by a french statistician named named michel Gobelin, and he sent the horoscope for one of the worst mass murderers in French history to 150 unsuspecting people and he asked them how well it fit them. 94% of the subjects said they recognized themselves in the description. Oh my goodness. What? Are you kidding me? Another study found that out of more than 3,000 specific horoscope predictions, only 10% proved true. So that means that the stars lead astrologers to incorrect predictions nine times out of ten. <laughs> oh my god. You're going to use this guy. I remember reading this and thinking, Sue, are you can you possibly be this dumb? Why didn't you look this up? I just, you know, I thought it was fun. I thought it was fun. Um I just do I'm not taking it seriously. It's just harmless fun. Well most Reverend Donald Montrose, he's the former bishop of Stockton, uh, California, he says no no, 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 you don't do that. Even though millions of people follow horoscopes with greater or lesser interest, this is still a type of fortune telling. Even if you say you don't believe in horoscopes and only read for fun, you should abandon that practice. The daily horoscope can easily influence you from time to time. It is a way in which we open ourselves to the occult. He's absolutely right. And again, it does influence you. Know, I, I do have to say, you know, that... As Catholics, we have kind of failed on a certain level educating, you know, our parishioners about this stuff because I, I, I tell people and, and obviously you haven't failed and Jeanette hasn't failed and we're, we're, we thank God for you. But, um, you know, I remember, you know, there was a time I was the national training manager for uh, Tupperware and I delivered training programs across Canada, across the United States. And I was really good at selling bowls and teaching the distributors how to, to, to sell them. Um, but when I was working for Tupperware, the national sales manager was like, are you Christian? Yeah, I'm Christian. Oh yeah, Christian, Christian. And um, I, I don't know, I started asking her about her sign and she looked at me, she goes, girl, you still read that stuff? And I'm like, well, <sighs> yeah. And she says, you've got to renounce that practice and you've got to go through your home and do a spiritual cleanse because if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you know, and I'm like, I looked at her and I thought, are you kidding? And, and then I started to Google, right? And I think that's when I came across, you know, Women of Grace, and that's when I came across all of, you know, and, and I'm like, okay, I am renouncing reading any horoscope. And again, you know, here I was in a, you know, secular environment, you know, delivering seminars, 
And someone, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit sent this national sales manager to challenge me. And so I want each of you here today to promise yourselves that somehow in some way at work, you're gonna bring this topic up because it takes women like you and I to talk to women that have left the church or maybe you know are at the water cooler because they don't know this stuff and the Holy Spirit needs you and the Holy Spirit needs me and Susan all to do our part. Okay, because um, you could put a, a, you could change a life based on one comment you made. You know, that woman made one comment to me and that one comment, the Holy Spirit used it and I stopped reading signs. I did a spiritual cleanse of my house, I had a priest come in and bless it. You here today have power to influence the women in your circle by sending them an email, by making a phone call. I'm on a big mission to get women to pick up the phone and talk to people again, you know? Have a conversation and say, you know, I attended Midday Moms today and Susan Brakeman and Dorothy Polarski, they were talking about yoga. I had no idea. I had no idea about uh, Reiki. I had no idea. Uh, you gotta tune in, okay? The Holy Spirit needs you. Please, I'm begging you today that you commit to doing something. The other thing I wanted to talk about and I'm asking Sue to, to educate us is I don't know about if any of you here are it from Vaughn, um, but you know, in a lot of I, I see in a lot, downtown Toronto, Vaughn, in a lot of different areas, you see an old bungalow created into a fortune teller's or a, 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 a psychic's kind of home. And there's, you know, a statue of our Blessed Mother and there's a statue of St. Francis. And how many times do you walk by or drive by these places and you think, oh, maybe she could help me see something or communicate with spirits. And I don't know, like, I never, thank God, walked into any one of those places, but you see them all the time. Um, can you tell us a little bit about fortune telling, about psychics, about maybe tarot cards? Um, can you tell us a little bit about those things? Right, all, all of those, um, that's known as divination. Uh, and that is all forbidden by the, by the Catholic Church because it is so dangerous, not because the church wants to be a killjoy, <laughs> because the stuff is dangerous. Um, Ouija boards in particular, some of the toughest cases of possession begin with Ouija boards because that's direct contact with the demonic. Um, tossing of runes, reading tea leaves, use of pendulums, tarot. This is all, don't get involved in it. Just stay away from it. Um, clairvoyant, uh, which would be psychics. You know, a clairvoyant uh, sees things. Uh, let me see how, how do they do it. They, 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 they see things in their, their head, the clairvoyant. The clairaudient hears things, the clairsentient feels things. That's how they, they do their different readings. Um, you want to be extremely careful when it comes to uh, mediums. Uh, mediums, they're in a league all by themselves because they claim to be able to contact the dead. And anyone who has any even a basic understanding of the supernatural realm knows that this is not possible. When the soul leaves the body and you become a disembodied uh, human soul, uh, you become just a mind you no longer have senses and all of our thought processes all of our communication with the material world is based on our senses the sight sound taste feeling etc and none of that's going to be available to us so after we're cut off from our senses we lose the ability to communicate with the material world okay we don't have that that's from theology now um and that makes perfect sense if you think about it um especially when it comes let's let's talk about ghosts for a minute here how can, there, how can a ghost really haunt the house? Or how can somebody's spirit appear to a medium when, first of all, the disembodied human soul is incapable of doing that. And second of all, his body is rotting in the ground somewhere, right? He doesn't have a voice box to make sounds. He doesn't have feet to make the floorboards creak. He doesn't have hands to throw pots and pans around in the middle of the night. So how do they haunt a house or appear at a, at a seance? Well. This being has to borrow a body, so to speak. And they do that by calling upon a source that has the power to do that. 
And that's either going to be a supernatural power, such as God, or a preternatural power, which are angels and demons. Mm -hmm. And we know that God doesn't do this because God tells us in scripture, and I'm going to say Deuteronomy 18.10, first and foremost, that people who consult with the dead are an abomination to him. And because angels exist only to do his will, uh, he's not going to allow them to do it either, right? So they're not going to have anything to do with that. Um, and he would never contradict himself by cooperating with the medium. Um, so if God, so if God isn't going to facilitate that, and his angels aren't going to facilitate that, and the disembodied human soul is not incapable of appearing or making a sound or communicating, who's left? Who's left that has the power to make that happen? The devil. And this is, again, people and fight like a Catholic. There's a whole reason I bought, I wrote that book <laughs> was for the first chapter in the book. It explains to you, this is what a preternatural being is. This is the power it has. And this is why it's doing all this stuff. And you think the psychic is doing it. Mm. Demons have it, unbelievable power. And they, the, the, they, they can't and read minds. They can't tell the future, but they can. They make excellent observations. They can communicate to psychics and mediums who are open to them. They're wide open to them. Um, they tell them, they feed them all kinds of information. They know if your Uncle Joe, you know, used to tug on your hair a certain way. They know all that stuff. They tell the medium that. Now, God does allow our dead sometimes to appear. We know that. Mm -hmm. He allows them to appear, you know, um, in purgatory. Mm -hmm. ask for prayer right mm -hmm. that's called invoking the dead and that's fine that's what we do in the, in, in, with the community of saints we we ask them to intercede for us we pray to them mm -hmm. and sometimes he allows them to appear to us for one reason or another but it's always to, usually to ask for prayer it's always for something serious it's not something frivolous like haunting a house he doesn't mm -hmm. do that so, so what the evoking the dead the... evoking is is what the psychic and the medium does they evoke the dead yeah, and invoking it, is fine. Evoking is not. Yeah, and and so I, I just wanted to stress to everyone that's you know uh, have joined us today, and thank you for joining us today, that you know, going to see a fortune teller or going to see a psychic or a medium, it is an extremely dangerous practice, and um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I've been not, not so much now, but in the past, you know, there'd be a wedding shower or there'd be a party at work. Um, and, you know, and sometimes, you know, they invite a fortune teller. Oh, this is just for fun, you know, or get your cards read just for fun. Well, you want to turn your back on that and run away from that as quickly as humanly possible. Um, someone's mentioning here in the chat box that, you know, that Ouija boards are actually for sale at Toys R Us yeah. and they're a direct access to evil. So um, if any of you have a Ouija board or your children have a Ouija board in their house or they've played Ouija, that is an extremely dangerous practice. Um, there are a couple of questions or comments that have come up here I and I just wanted to- here. Yeah, I'm looking at them right now. I'm looking yeah. at them. Yeah, so someone is saying, it's my understanding that a person can be healed by occult energy, but that the effect is temporary while the overall person's spiritual life can be declining. Do you believe this to be true? I was formal, formerly in the naturopathic profession and believe homeopathy to be an example of this. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, that, that is true. That is true that um, occult powers... Um... A demon can inflict an illness on a person and then make it seem as though he healed it by removing the affliction that he actually put there. So that is one way that it is. It's also, he is uh, very skilled in the power of illusion. Um, not delusion, but illusion. Um, he can make you think that you are experiencing something when you are not. And that, of course, put that on top of the placebo effect. And you have a lot of people who really desperately want to be healed of something. And of course, he plays upon that emotion. And he makes you believe that that you've been healed, even yeah. when you have not. Yeah, and, and there's a, a another question here. What happens if someone in our household takes a space of the house as her official site of or meditation temple to practice yoga? Is there something we can do in this space to make it holy? Yeah, if that person is calling upon uh, Hindu gods, um, she's calling upon some 
nefarious beings, dark beings. And, and uh, yeah, you would have to, I would ask the person to stop. If they want to do that, do it somewhere else. Uh, don't do it in the house. Or you're going to have to use, I would suggest, uh, blessed salt or holy water on that site. Because uh, they could be calling, you know, the meditation temple, that makes me nervous because what are they calling down? If they're practicing any kind of Hindu, particularly Hindu, um, because their mantras normally are the name of, of Hindu gods, um, they're actually calling demons down uh, upon them. So make sure that you yourself are in a state of grace um, because you are, he can't touch you if you're in a state of grace. And the, I guess, too, the, the, the one thing our ministry, um, one of our goals, yes, our primary goal is to revive the, the vocation of motherhood, that motherhood isn't just a series of tasks, but that it's a divine mission. And one thing that I've noticed a lot is that a lot of moms, they, they've sort of relinquished their authority as mother in the home oftentimes because they're so exhausted right like uh, i'm yeah. so exhausted i'm so overworked you know i'm working all day i'm working all night i'm cooking i'm cleaning and they lose their matriarchal authority right and they lose their conviction that they've been a, given a deposit of faith to pass down to their children and that is more important than any other work that they do. Like, that's why our ministry exists. You know, like I, I often say that, you know, we give our kids Nike, we give our kids iPads, we give our kids an education, we give our kids money, we give our kids travel. We, you know, we give our kids everything, but have we, with our whole heart and being, done everything that we can to pass down the Catholic faith? And yes, there are kids that are gonna reject it, but I always say to my kids, if you reject your faith, I know that the day that I die, I have done everything humanly possible to make it relevant, to make it true, to make it authentic, and to make it fun. And I've got a clear conscience. I've got a clear conscience that I haven't put paying off the house first. I haven't put my profession first. I haven't put, um, you know, other things first. My first duty is, as a Catholic mother, to transmit the Catholic faith. I've got a clear conscience, so help me God. And, you know, many moms, they're not claiming their authority as mother in the house. Like, whenever I think of our Blessed Mother, I think of her foot down on Satan on a snake and saying, not in my house, honey. Right? Yeah. And so... If, you know, someone, you know, I had a, this is straight up, I've never shared this publicly before, but today's the day. I had a niece that was heavily into uh, the, you know, Reiki as a practice. And uh, I have a, you know, half brother that went heavily, heavily, heavily into the new age. And she said to me, Dorothy, you know, I want to touch your children. I want to heal them. Um, I'm seeing a medium. And I said, not in my house. And she hasn't been here since. And, you know, I don't know, some of you might disagree with that. But I was like, I am not letting anyone touch my four-year-old and my five-year-old. And I'm not going to risk it that, you know, like, okay, now that they're adults, I might say, okay, you've got more freedom as the adult to interact with her. But after reading the book, The Secret, and consulting a medium, and, you know, she left her husband, <laughs> she, <laughs> she, 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 I just couldn't, you know, it was just, I'm going to attract it's horrible. It's horrible. And I pray for her every day. And I, uh, but I'm like, I am not going to let people risk the salvation of my soul and my family soul by allowing that stuff into my house. Sorry, it's not coming into my house. And I, I did speak to a priest about it because I, I, you know, I love her dearly and everything. And he goes, Dorothy, you were acting to protect your family's spiritual well-being. You didn't do anything wrong. And so if you know, for example, that your son or your daughter is doing bad stuff on the internet, I say, rip out the modem and throw it out the window. Right. If you know that someone is doing wrong with the iPhone, 
you take that phone, you claim it, you're paying for that bill. And, you know, there's yeah. got to be something more important to you than your children, your husband. And, you know, the, 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 God's got to be number one, right? God's got to be number one. And the Holy Spirit has to be number one. And, you know, my mom, when I was spewing crazy stuff at my mom, because I did in my late, you know, early 20s, I did spew, you know, my mother's like, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you know, I'm like, that's the kind of mother I had. <laughs> And uh, I, I tell this story a, a whole bunch of times, but when I was going through all these problems and, you know, Satan attacked me big time in my like mid twenties. Uh, you know, I think sometimes we worry about our children and we forget that when kids are in college that they get majorly attacked. And I was having all of these problems, major problems. We go on to Poland on holidays and I thought, oh, I know. I need to go see a hypnotist. And there was a hypnotist being advertised in a Polish newspaper. And my mother was like, not over my dead body, <laughs> you know? And she, and I was in my twenties. Okay. Like, so when I hear people saying, oh, let children, you know, they're adults now, let them make their own decisions. I'm like, no way. I thank God that my mother laid herself down and she claimed authority, her maternal authority, and said, while we're on this holiday, girl, you ain't going on to see no hypnotist because you saw it in a Polish newspaper and you think because she's Polish and religious that it's good. No way. Not when you're under my care, right? And so as mothers, I don't know, I kind of feel like if mothers won't state the truth and if mothers won't fight the fight and if mothers won't put their foot on the snake, we're freaking losing it. Sorry, ladies. Like, <laughs> you know, anyway, I'm sorry I, I ranted. I didn't mean to rant. No, but I mean, it's, I, I, I do, I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, what we need to do, this is something we learn in Carmel, and Teresa of Avila teaches us this, that, that as you progress in the spiritual life, you learn to die to self and to live more and more for God. And you learn how to love the way Jesus loved, which was selflessly, right? And that's what we need to do when we're loving our children, especially when our children are going the wrong way and they're trying to bring it into our house. It's one yeah. thing if they're adults and they're out and they're doing other things, there's nothing you can do about that. No. If they're bringing it into your house, then you need to sit down with that person. And I would always pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit because he can tell you a way to speak to that child that will work rather than yeah. you coming out there, you know, and banging them over the head. Don't do yeah, yeah, yes, yes, if yes. somebody had done that to me, I would have just done it all the more, you know, just to get yes. back. But, you know, has somebody had sat down to say, here, this is, these are some of the things I've heard about yoga. You know, what do you think about this? Some of these things are kind of troubling, you know, about these Hindu gods and that, and, you know, da, da, da and try to talk with that, that child and get them to understand and then just say, you know what? I really don't want this going on in my house. Um, it's just making me feel kind of creepy. And I think you can understand that I'm feeling kind of creepy. And you know, try to, try to come at it in that way with them. That and also mothers to be very, very careful with their daughters right now, because I don't know if it's this way in Canada, but it is in the United States. They are heavily, heavily involved in witchcraft. This is a big thing with young girls. And they're getting it off social media, the Insta witches. And these are the Instagram witches. And they, and I'm telling you, today's witch is very hip. She's trendy. She's on top of it. She's a feminist. She's like, hey, this is your empowerment. This is where you're going to get your power. From. And it's raking in girls by the millions. And they're out there. Watch whatever they're, they have in their rooms. I don't know how many mothers have written to say, hey, I found a shoebox with like a bunch of incense sticks wrapped up in jute. And then some some uh, crystals attached to it. The, they have no idea what they're finding in their, their girls' rooms. And this stuff is all related to witchcraft so, and, and magic. This magic that everybody thinks is so innate it, you know, it, in it, children's it, books. It's not. Um, it, this is sorcery. And what you're doing is you're teaching your children that if they want to get something, they want to get their way, um, they can just resort to sorcery. And that's how they're going to get it. So you got to be really careful with the stuff that's out there right now because kids are being fed by this. Everything is cult based anymore. Everything they're, is. The video being, games, everything. Pulled in hook, line, and sinker, the video games. Um, there's a, 
oh my gosh, it's 311. I'm sorry. I went to... Oh, it is. Oh my goodness. I see the but, uh, we, we, we still have 60 moms on, but um, anyway, uh, someone's asking me, um, someone's saying uh, there's a GTA high school that introduced Wicca from their moms. Oh my gosh. Um, just last question, because I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that, that it was already 3.15. I don't mean, mean to be taking more of your time, but someone asked a question here specifically about homeopathic medicine and seeing a naturopath. Um, can you educate us a little bit about, um, about that? Yeah, you got to be careful with that. Well, homeopathy um, is totally unscientific. It's it's actually the joke of the science world because it is so terribly unscientific. Um, I can't get into the whole explanation of it because we really don't have time for all that. I have a whole chapter in my book, uh, The New Age Compendium on homeopathy, and it, and it tells you why it is complete quackery. Mm -hmm. Stay away from it. It doesn't heal anything. It's impossible. It goes against all the laws of physics as we know it today. Um, it is very new age. It's been taken over by new agers. Um, you know, naturopaths, depending on what they're getting into, um, naturopaths can also go off the deep end um, and getting into all of this uh, natural, pure type things. Um, you just got to stay, be very, very careful about alternative medicine. Okay. Now, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm beginning to think... Um that maybe we should have a retreat with you online <laughs> or detail about some of these things. Cause uh, you know, you know, someone's now asking about acupuncture and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe we should have you back and, and, and do a little bit more of a formal, um, more of a formal event or, or something. So maybe you and I can, you know, can talk about that. Um, anyway, I, I wanted to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. Um, you know, we, we love you very, very much. Please know that you're in my daily prayers in our ministry. Uh, Catholic Moms Group offers two masses a month for all of your intentions. Dynamic Women of Faith also offers two masses a month for the women that have attended our conferences. So um, we're, we're doing, you know, the best that we can to, 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 to share whatever grace has been given to us. We want to thank um, Susan. Uh, she's been this hero of mine for, for, I always wish I could go to a family party and have her on my shoulder, you know, <laughs> because so many times I get shut down because I, 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 I just don't have the wealth of knowledge. I just, have had the firsthand negative experience and renounced it. So it's, uh, it's really, really remarkable to have had finally the opportunity to meet you. So uh, thank you so much for your dedication. Thank you for your hard work. And thank you for sharing your gifts with, you know, millions of uh, just women all over the world. And, um, you know, when I think of all the souls your work has saved, uh, it just brings a huge smile to, to, to my face. And I am going to look pretty seriously about having you back and maybe having you back for a retreat where um, we can, you know, go into more topics and maybe a little bit more depth. Um, so I always like to close our session uh, with a, a short song, <laughs> and it, it's a great way that it reveals how old I am. I'm so glad we had this time together, just to have a laugh or sing a song. Seems we just get started, and before you know it, comes a time we have to say so long. And so for those, those of you that know Carol Burnett, <laughs> um, so just a closing prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we know that wherever two or more are gathered in your name, that you are present. We thank you for your presence. We rejoice in your presence. We beg that all of the graces that you dispense today not be lost. And we pray that the women that attended today that the Holy Spirit remind them and give them the courage to renounce um, any evil spirits or any innocent dabbling in this stuff. 
just pray a special blessing over Susan and thanksgiving for her work. And we ask our Blessed Mother to wrap her loving arms around Susan as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Catholic Moms Group. Don't forget the donate button because we need it. People always say, oh, Dorothy, you should do this. And Dorothy, you should do that. And Dorothy, you should do this. <laughs> I'm like, we're a very small ministry. You're looking at it. <laughs> you know. Uh, so um, we have, you know, 40 volunteer mothers group leaders. Uh, there's so many things that our ministry would love to do. And if you benefited in any little way, um, please, you know, don't forget to make a, a donation so that, um, you know, so that we can continue the work that we do and uh, we can invite Susan back for, a, you know, a full day with us and spend more time. So thank you, all of you, for joining us. Uh, we love you. Uh, please, if you enjoyed it, tell five people. If each of us told five people, imagine, you know. Um, thank you very much, Susan. Thank you to each of you and uh, just love you. Mwah! And uh, it was a real honor having you here today. Bye, Susan. Love you very thank much. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Bye-bye now. Bye now. Bye-bye.